Good evening and welcome to Resource PNG. On tonight's show, we feature the National Petroleum Company of Papua New Guinea, NPCP. Highlights of the Mining and Petroleum Conference and we talk to Papua Mining. In this first segment, we talk to Wapu Song, the Managing Director of NPCP. We find out about the role of the company when LNG exports commence this year. As NPCP is fairly new, Mr. Sonk explains the company's history. The driving force behind NPCP is the Kumul Consolidation Agenda. Mr. Sonk explains in this interview how this improves the governance of NPCP. Good evening, viewers. I have with me Mr. Wapu Sonk, the Managing Director for the National Petroleum Company. Good evening, sir. Well, good evening. Thank you. So, um, what will the role of the National Petroleum Company be when LNG exports commence? Um, NPCP is a, um, is a state entity which is now participating in the PNG LNG project. Uh, we will continue to be a, a partner in the project, even uh, through commissioning and production. So we will remain as a partner in the project throughout the life of the project. Okay. And this, this is fairly new NPCP for the viewers who don't know? Uh, um, NPCP, your National Petroleum Company of Papua New Guinea, was formerly known as Croton. Number two, okay. uh, it was established in uh, in 2008 uh, as a shell company under IPBC, um, and then uh, government nominated that shell company to be the uh, the uh, entity to hold the interest of the state uh, in the project. In 2010, it became a a um, operating company. Um, that's when we uh, we started operating as a as a commercial entity looking after the state's interest in the project. So it's, it's fairly new, and not a lot of Papua New Guineans know, know about the uh, existence of NPCP, but um, slowly uh, people will know uh, what NPCP is and, and, and uh, what role it plays in the PNG LNG project. We are the largest partner, and we contribute our share of the co cost in, in, in the uh, construction of the PNG LNG project that now is, is uh, going, slowly going into um, uh, commissioning. Uh, sure. at this stage. Thank you. Um, on a more personal front, you're an engineer by profession with a wealth of experience in the oil and gas sector. You now head NPCP. What set of values do you bring to the company? I think I, I bring a set of skills that, that uh, I've built up over the last 18 years or so, uh, working in, in the oil fields in, in Sun Islands. Um, working with communities, uh, knowing how the government operates, how, how, how the interaction happens between oil and gas companies and, 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 and uh, um, landowners and provincial governments and, and uh, local level governments, uh, as well as the, the, the technical skill itself in extraction of, of oil and gas uh, and, and taking it to market. Um, and that that uh, hands-on experience and, and knowing how to actually do it um, and, and helping younger Papua New Guineans develop in that process. I've been part of developing, uh, transferring skills to younger graduates that came through the system. So, uh, okay. you know, that, that kind of skill set that I'm, I'm value that I'm bringing to the, uh, to the company. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that it's fairly new and also um, about the new graduates. What expertise are you looking for in building up your NPCP team? Uh, it's an oil and gas company, so um, just like every other oil and gas companies, we are looking for geologists, uh, we are looking for geophysicists, uh, petroleum engineers. Not many of the skills around, so we, you know, we, uh, we know who, who, who has the skills, and we we're working with um, with uh, the few that are in in country uh, to bring them on board, and and, and uh, they have. So we are attracting people from oil sets and ExxonMobil and, and Talisman and other, other uh, international companies that are in PNG. They want to come and contribute uh, in, in NPCP. Um, so we are attracting back the skill sets. And then you have the legal skills and the commercial skills um, and marketing skills that we need mm -hmm. to be a truly active oil and gas company. So driving all of this is the Kumo Consolidation Agenda. How does this improve the corporate governance of NPCP? Um, Kumo, Kumo Consolidation Agenda is a government uh, government's agenda to, to um, consolidate petroleum assets into one entity and mineral assets into one entity, 
my understanding is that it's still work in progress at the moment. Uh, it's a government policy that I can't really elaborate more on, but it's, uh, it's in broader terms, it's a policy to consolidate uh, petroleum and, and, and mining assets into different entities. Um, NPCP will be one of the entities that go into, into Kumu. Some assets in petroleum will come under that, that's my understanding. Uh, IPBC has some assets like the oil set shares, if we buy it back from IPIC. So it's a consolidation of all those petroleum assets into one entity called petroleum, uh, Kumu Petroleum. Yep. The mining will go through the same, like Octedi and Tolokuma and other mineral assets yep. Yep. going under Kumu Minerals. Okay. So political support has been crucial in driving um, national participation in the resource economy. Is this the right time for PNG to enter the resource sector? Uh, this, we've, we've always been in the resource sector. Uh, we've, in the last 21 years or so that we've, produced, we've been producing oil and gas, we've always been in there. Uh, MRDC has been in there, PRK, Petroleum Research Group has been there. And then we started out with uh, Origin Minerals uh, when we had Moran development. And then uh, we have Petromin that was established, and then now NPCP. So we've always been in the equity participation. Uh, so it's not new. Um, same in the mining sector as well. So we've, we've always taken up our e equity in the, in the resource development. So we've always participated. The, the uh, main issues have been in, in consolidating. We haven't been able to consolidate all those different participating interests to get into one holding company so that uh, we have a stronger balance sheet, we have a concentration of technical skills, and we can uh, actively pursue resource extraction in partnership with the, the, um, the um, international you know, oil and gas companies and mineral companies. Yeah. yeah, thank you. NPC aims to be a driving force in the oil and gas sector. How do you aim to achieve this? We, we want to be in the middle uh, and drive uh, resource development. Uh, uh, basically what that means is is that some discoveries are uh, isolated. Uh, they are not closer to infrastructure. So those, those assets, NPCB uh, could play a role in bringing those, those isolated discoveries into market by laying pipeline, uh, connecting into existing facilities, uh, encouraging that development to happen um, uh, because we are able to drive the development agenda for the country as a state-owned entity more so than the international oil and gas companies would. So we can, we can do some of the front-end work if that's necessary to encourage development. Mm -hmm. So as a state-owned company, um, you have the people's interest more than the international companies, is that correct? We will have a balanced view of things. Uh, our shareholders are the people of Papua New Guinea uh, through the state. So um, our thinking will be influenced by what the shareholders' expectations are. Mm -hmm. So um, we will always uh, you know, have, a uh, have a balanced approach um, in, in approach in, in maturing some of these, these commercial opportunities. Yep. How can PNG as a nation overcome the perception that it does not have the technical expertise and financial capacity to be actively engaged in the resource sector? How can we overcome that perception? I think, I think we need, first of all, we need political support, and the political support is there. Uh, Prime Minister just today talked about uh, the conference about uh, Kumul Consolidation Agenda and Kumul Petroleum and Kumul Minerals Company setting up. Uh, that's the political support that we need. And below that is, is developing the right skill set, putting the right people at the management level to provide the leadership that know the industry, that know what it takes to get there. It will take a long time, but we need the, we need the right human resource with the right tools, right management uh, processes and procedures and right you know, systems, right governance around that to, to develop a proper commercial entity which will look after our interest in the oil and gas and, you know, um, sector. Thank you, sir, for coming on Resource PNG.
Thank you. That was Mr. Wapu Song joining us here tonight on Resource PNG. Resource PNG continues when we return. Welcome back. The PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum hosts conferences and seminars to provide updates on the mining and petroleum industry's activities. In this next segment, we look at this report that features highlights from the 13th PNG Mining and Petroleum Conference held in December 2013. The Papua Guinea Chamber of Mines and Petroleum held its Mining and Petroleum seminars from the 3rd to the 6th of December last year. Industry players, analysts and investors flocked to Port Moresby to receive updates and analyse trends in the resources sector. On everyone's mind was the reality of a two-speed resource sector. Whilst the petroleum sector was buzzing with much hype about the PNG LNG project and the Stanley gas field, the mining sector was seeing a correction in the industry. All in all though, there was much optimism about the opportunities presented by the diverse resource profile of Papua New Guinea. Different players from the wheelbarrow miners of Crater Mountain to deep ocean drillers of the Papuan Gulf shared the rewards that exist for those who have the patience and the courage to invest in Papua New Guinea. However, this sense of optimism was slightly deflated by the real political regulatory changes and associated sovereign risks. Speaking in his capacity as the president of the Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, Geria Aopi summarized the cautious optimism of the industry. We are in for an exciting year ahead with the transforming PNG LNG project coming to fruition with first LNG exports in the latter part of 2014. More new projects have been pursued in the petroleum sector. However, on the flip side, the growth we have seen for a considerable period in the mining sector is in steep decline due to falling commodity prices and also the unfriendly financial markets. The Chamber has been watching closely the events unfolding in the political arena and knows with interest a number of recent events. The Chamber appreciates the government's determined efforts in running the affairs of the country and the political stability we have seen in recent times. However, there seems to be a growing climate of uncertainty that is sending the wrong message to the investment community. And this could affect both in our industry as well as investment in the country generally. Before inviting the Prime Minister to give the keynote address for the conference, the Aobi emphasized the, the need for a sound regulatory environment. There are also some concerns about delays and inconsistencies in terms of regulatory approvals. We hope that some of these issues will be addressed as part of the, uh, the mining review that's been undertaken and also the transformation of the Department of Petroleum into an authority as approved by NEC this year. The Chamber would like to thank the government for the decision and I can assure you, Prime Minister and Minister, that the Chamber stands ready to assist the government in achieving this. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to invite Prime Minister, Mr. Peter O'Neill, to officially open the four days of resource seminars. Ladies and gentlemen, Prime Minister. Whilst noting the theme of last year's conference, Prime Minister O'Neill focused his speech on the government's policy direction that is aimed at ensuring the economic benefits of the resource sector are socially inclusive. The government's focus now is to assist partners in the resource sector who are willing to translate PNG's natural resource wealth into social and economic benefits for everyday Papua New Guineans.
From an industry perspective, it means a greater focus on corporate social responsibility. The Prime Minister was adamant that more Papua New Guineans receive direct benefits from the resource sector. The Chairman of the Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, Mr. Gary Halpy, distinguished guests, friends of Papua New Guinea, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, let me thank the Chamber of Mines and Petroleum for inviting me here today to open the first of these two important resource sectors seminar has been held this week. I am told by the Chamber that attendance at both seminars uh, are well and truly up with expectations. I welcome you and especially I welcome our overseas industry participants to Port Mosby and Papua New Guinea. Both the petroleum and mining seminars are being held at a, at a very important time for both sectors in our country. While I will focus my comments on the oil and gas sectors, some of my comments will equally be applicable to the mining sector and other resource development as a whole. I also note that the theme of this seminar is transforming the economy, uh, the gas era. It is very much right on the mark because the gas era does offer a once in a lifetime opportunity to transform Papua New Guinea and its economy and the lives of our people. What I want to stress and focus on today is very simple. The transformation must deliver the maximum benefits for Papua New Guinea and our seven and a half billion people. And I, don't, I do not just mean economic benefits. It must deliver significant, widely shared social and community benefits as all. Well. The Prime Minister also highlighted an opportunity cost that was missed because of the way state negotiators failed in their fiduciary duty when they negotiated the PNG LNG project. There are stranded gas fields that cannot be developed alone but do not benefit from the LNG pipeline due to the nature of the gas agreement. O'Neill said he would like to see the economic potential of stranded gas fields realized. Let me briefly outline a few of the priority areas for the next and future phase of our petroleum sector development. We must maximize our diversification. As I said, we cannot rely on LNG alone. Although it is important and valuable, we must ensure that the next phase of our sector includes developing stranded gas developments that can meet our domestic power and energy needs, industry development in our regions, and especially in our less developed regions. The industry and the government must work together to attract significant investment in downstream processing industries, high energy using industries, so that we can expand our industrial base, create more employment, and boost exports. More of this report after the break. You're with Resource PNG. We continue with highlights from the 13th Mining and Petroleum Conference. The Prime Minister also focused on the state's aggressive push as a player in the exploitation of PNG's resources. The context of his statement was in light of the takeover of the giant's Octeri mine and the rationalization of the state's mining and petroleum interests under the auspices of Kumul Holdings. Many in the audience were keen on what the Prime Minister was to highlight. Our government, as many of you know, is in the process of setting up a separate company to manage our equity and participation in the resource sector. A Kumul Petroleum with a separate company for Kumul Minerals are going to manage our equity in the resource sectors. This is designed to separate our investments so that it is not confused or conflicted. We do not want to become passive investors in these projects. We hold equity on behalf of the nation. We want 
to be proactive and constructive and participant in the companies and projects. That is why we have charged Kumul Petroleum and Kumul Minerals in doing that. The government will actively participate in new projects. And I guess that is not nationalism. It is just common sense. It is what our laws provide for and what our people expect. Following the Prime Minister's speech, the then Petroleum Minister, William Duma, highlighted the instructional reforms at his former department. The government is responding to the growth in the petroleum sector by realigning the petroleum department as a statutory authority. These reforms are aimed at improving efficiency, governance and global competitiveness. This morning, and I've, uh, I've actually been told to restrict myself to only one uh, subject, and that is the uh, new Petroleum and Energy Authority. So this morning, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll update um, all of us here of the activities that uh, my ministry and the department uh, have uh, done so far this, this year in relation to the establishment of the uh, long-awaited uh, uh, Petroleum and Energy Authority. Um, the authority, uh, ladies and gentlemen, will be a statutory authority, um, obviously, to replace uh, the current uh, Department of Petroleum and Energy. And uh, the uh, principal objective is to make this new uh, entity becoming a more, become a more robust uh, and more efficient uh, regulator of our country's uh, expanded energy sector, uh, particularly the uh, hydrocarbon sector. Uh, Papua New Guinea needs a strong and robust regulator in the face of very strong foreign investment and international investor confidence in our country's uh, energy sector. And um, as Minister of Petroleum and Energy, as well as our Prime Minister O'Neill, we'd like to see uh, this, uh, this is achieved as soon as we can. Uh, in terms of progress so far in implementing the establishment of the authority, uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, our state solicitor has approved uh, and provided the necessary uh, certificate of necessity, and that has paved the way for uh, the government of uh, Prime Minister O'Neill to approve the establishment of the authority. Uh, my ministry and the department have uh, developed a work program and a budget and formal work in terms of undertaking uh, the required uh, milestone activities to establish the authority, and this will uh, commence early next year. Also speaking during the four-day conference was the Minister for Mining, Byron Chan. Chan acknowledged the difficult economic climate faced by the industry and expressed the government's willingness to work with the industry to resolve issues affecting the industry. Chan gave an overview of the current state of the mining industry. The O'Neill Beyond government is very well aware of the issues affecting our mining industry and has taken bold steps to rectify mistakes that were made in the past and to ensure real issues of major concern affecting our people and the mining industry. The single largest industry that contributes immensely to this nation are addressed <coughs> within the term of this government. PNG's potential in the mining sector is demonstrated by the existence of some world-class projects. Many of these mines themselves have their own unique challenges as follows. Octedi, the Octedi mine has just been acquired by the government. We will be extending its mine life beyond 2022. The government is attending to sorting out the redistribution of its acquired interests from PNGSDP to strengthen the mine's sustainability going forward. <clears throat> Bulgaria has continued to be faced with uh, trespassing by illegal miners and has posed a serious law and order issue, issue that must be dealt with immediately and decisively. And I will, and I will be meeting with relevant law enforcement agencies to ensure that this law and order concern is addressed. Lihir, Lihir has recently completed its million ounce of plant upgrade, Mopu, and we expect 
to witness an increase output of in production, royalties, infrastructure developments, and social indicators for Lihirians. Hidden Valley is faced with the challenge of reducing the cost of running the mine and has identified these bottlenecks and is attending to put to put in, in place measures to turn the operations around profitably. Our smaller mines are Tolokuma Mine, which was recently placed under its own care and maintenance by the operator Petromin. The challenge for the project is in recapitalization of the mine equipment and its processing activities. The Cinevid Mine is embarking on an optimization program to improve the recovery of gold from its existing vats prior to embarking on transforming its current processing facility into a conventional one. Simberi is about to complete its commissioning for the plant upgrade. And Ramu project has just achieved 50% of production ramp up and is anticipated to be in full production capacity by the next year. This is our first diversified mine having shipped nickel and cobalt chromite today. Apart from operating mines, we have a number of advanced mines and explorations whose updates you will be hearing directly from the operators over the next two days. The government is committed to ensuring that these projects are advanced such they are brought on stream to be the next pipeline of mining projects over the next five to ten years. With the re renewed interest in the mining potential in Papua New Guinea, it is obvious that PNG has the potential to be well developed, to be a well-developed nation, if we can properly and effectively harness these mining projects and maximize the benefits that are available to us as a nation. Resource PNG continues when we return. You're with Resource PNG. We continue with highlights from the 13th Mining and Petroleum Conference. We're in the oil and gas sector. Um, and so here we are now. And I think heritage is a very good fit for, um, for this country as well. So that's my bio. Summarizing the proceedings, in the oil and gas exploration sector, Heritage Oil agreed with Kina Petroleum to farm in to two onshore licenses. PPL337 and PPL437. PPL437 is located in a proven hydrocarbon system east of the Stanley gas field in Western Annual Province. In return for earning a 70% working interest and operatorship of PPL337, Heritage will fund the cost of drilling two shallow exploration wells. PPL337 is located in the Banan Anticline in the Ranu Basin of Medang Province. Another player in the oil and gas sector, New Guinea Energy, announced that it had de-risked some of its assets to industry majors including Talisman, Mitsubishi and Exxon Mobil. New Guinea Energy will now concentrate on oil targets within five onshore license areas. Talisman, meanwhile, is focused on executing its early liquids projects at Stanley, Elevala and Ketu. Hydrocarbons giant Exxon Mobil informed participants that the LNG project was on schedule. A time-lapse video highlighted the complexity of the construction process, which perhaps was a plus for Papua New Guinea. The PNG LNG project has demonstrated to the global investment community that PNG can deliver on multi-billion dollar investments. Oil Search's biggest announcement at the conference was that it had found a new geological region in the Gulf of Papua. In layman's terms, Oil Search found sand. Not only sand, but geological sandstone that could potentially hold a treasure trove of oil and gas resources in the Gulf of Papua. So it actually works. 
In the mining sector, perhaps the attendance in the room painted a picture of difficult times. Basically, there is little appetite in the financial markets to place bets on mineral exploration and development. Highlands Pacific told participants that it had rationalized exploration activity in the Star Mountains. Highlands Pacific was, however, optimistic about the production ramping up at the Ramu Nickel Mine and the world-class Frida River deposit. There was some good news as well from Mount Kare, with Indochine mining being able to gain support of local landowners. Perhaps credit for this is due to the senior management of Indochine, headed by George Niumataiwalu. How many senior mine managers understand the sacred geography of their mines like George does? Let me talk a little bit about this, because this is, for me, very important in Mount Kare. You don't get this right, you're never going to have a social license to be up there. Proper identification of landowners, I said, the key important thing. We've got to figure out how to properly identify these people. And knowing their cosmology, knowing the sacred geography, knowing all that stuff is very important. Okay? I'm a mining engineer by training, but most times I'm behaving like an anthropologist, a sociologist, because that is just as important in delivering this thing. Okay? Also, as I said before, the framework for distributing benefits, we're figuring out that within the houseman structure, in their culture, They've got systems that we can tap into. Okay? It's just a matter of figuring it out and understanding the lens in which they view the world and bringing that in so we can capitalize on that. This is a big one. When development comes, and in this part of the highlands, they've got three types of leadership. There's a fight leader comes up when, the lead, when there's a fight. There's a compensation leader when there's time to compensate when the fighting's done. And then there's a mouse man. He's uh, the stalks and... Uh, and motivates everybody. But these are not the models of leadership to take people to, to development, okay? And this is, these are the challenges that we face. How do we develop a leadership model that gets away from that kind of leadership and that looks more at, at community-type issues, an egalitarian, a civilian-based um, uh, leadership that empowers people, okay? This is a real key challenge for, for mining companies. Same thing I, I, I faced when I looked at Hidden Valley. Being guys in the Watuts and you've got the Goylalas in the middle, same deal, right? How do you get these people to look at a model for development and say, how can we all share in the benefits? And how can we prosper from this thing? This is a, a sociological challenge. How do you define a clan up here? Because the clan is the basic unit, primary landowning unit. And there's been discussions about the unboundedness of these clans, okay, the diffusiveness of uh, these clans. And it's very important because up here, it's a cognitic environment where both the matrilineal and, and patrilineal side can claim ownership to, uh, to a piece of land. Okay? So we as developers have to understand these things. Okay? I, mean, I, I would love to just do mining engineering and those sorts of things, but I, I don't have the, the luxury to do that because I've got to deliver on this project. Okay? And I've got to deal with those, those issues and understand them. More of this report after the break. You're with Resource PNG. We continue with highlights from the 13th Mining and Petroleum Conference. Mobile Mining also announced a globally significant resource size of around 79 million ounces of porphyry copper gold deposit at Wafu Golpu. This places amongst the top 10 copper gold deposits in the world. MMJV is currently conducting surface drilling in anticipation of underground exploration to fully define the resource. Marengo's Yandera project is still on the tarmac despite informing the industry previously that it was ready to take off. Marengo has been able to secure Chinese backing for the copper gold resource that is expected to be mined over 20 years. The lack of infrastructure means that Marengo will have to build from scratch in order to mine and export from Medang. Copper Molly, which has the highly perspective NACU target in East New Britain, also highlighted potential upside in its resource. And its NACU 2 prospect, a massive sulfide zone intersected at 6.7 meters, yielding 3.8% copper, while the primary copper zone yielded 0.84% copper. These high-grade resource indicators demonstrate huge potential in the region.
Finally, Obteddy Mining Limited highlighted a year which Managing Director Nigel Parker described to be like riding a tiger. And what a rough ride it has been for the mine in Star Mountains of Western Province. Octedi experienced flooding of the mine pit, a breakdown of its ancient sag mill, and difficulties exporting copper after its major buyer was blown out of business by Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. The icing on the cake was the bitter dispute between the state and PNG Sustainable Development Limited over ownership of the mine. Nonetheless, Octeti Mine has been able to weather the storm and manage the transition towards mine life extension. And that's how the cookie crumbled at last year's Mining and Petroleum Summit. This year's Mining and Petroleum Conference will be held at the Hilton in Sydney. That ends this edition of Resource PNG. If you have any comments or queries, do email us on this address, resourcepng at mtv.com.pg. Or to find out more, check MTV online, that's www.mtv.com.pg, and go to our Resource PNG page. Or you can check our page on Facebook. Thanks for your company. Bye for now.